Well, here I am with my little mask. I have to go to a big city called, big city, well, our regional capital. It's actually in a different province, it's a, but it's the closest big city here. Uh, to, well, I go see my doctor every couple of months and check this out, it's completely empty. There's this warning, giving some rules on what to do, what not to do. I'm carrying my little mask, Sharma. <laughs> Uh, in my pocket, I have one that's kind of cool, it's stretchy, it, you hook it behind your ears. And the first thing I find is that there's nobody at the station. Oh my god, I look like Dracula, my eyes are all red. Yeah, there's nobody at the station. So I would have put it, oh, these are, so these are the, vending machines where you buy your tickets at. But they're notorious. Bagno sta dentro dentro il bar, solo che non so se è aperto e dovresti vedere. Scusa, per caso c'hai l'autobus RM208, quello che va a Monte Cascone, lo si prende? Qua si fermano tutti. Perfetto. Sì. E poi qualsiasi di loro ti dirà Se... Ciao. And um, he's asking for if I know a certain bus that goes a certain place. Um, I was saying, yeah, they're notorious for taking your money and then if there's no change, tough luck. And I only have a 50 euro bill on me, so I, I didn't want to put it in the machine. And if they catch you on the train, um, if they catch you on the train, it's like two times or three times more the cost of the ticket. So they send me, you walk up here and there's, this is a, the main street of, of the little subdivision where the train station's at. And they told me to get the ticket at the stationery the stationery here but everything looks closed mind you it's about quarter to, t to ten so everything that's not essential is closed and I suppose the to, well the the station is a tobacco store the tobacco stores are the the little shops that are licensed to sell tobacco and usually you can pay your bills. So, uh, you can pay your bills here and, um, you know, it looks like a, like a school shop with books and stuff. And a cool kid, probably the son of the, the owner. Un biglietto per Terni. Andate a ridorno. And um, I don't know what to call him. I posso pagare con la reto cittadinanza? Con la carta? Oh, well. No, because I have this card. Eh, dimmi. Ah, okay, great. I have this card that, um, that I can pay with. My little state help card. Pay the train ticket with, and that way I save cash because what they do here uh, so that you don't abuse, you know, is you can't e take... Adesso, oggi? Sì, si, andate a ritorno, sì. Si. Anche oggi ritorno. Sì. Si. A Terni. Um, is, you can't take out more than a certain amount of cash. So wait, I want to show you these stores, because they're kind of cute. They're very kitsch, and they have, usually they have kids' toys, and ladies' perfumes. Look at the dolls up there. <laughs> and uh, you know, and then they they do little official business like pay your phone bill or sell tobacco. Look 
Okay, I'm gonna end it here because. Okay. Kilo Louis? Sí. Okay. 20 euros, sí. Two. Doppio gas. <laughs> Ciao, grazie. So, see, so these guys are waiting because we can only go in so many at a time. So, those guys are waiting outside. And see that when you, when they have that tea, it means tobacco store, tobacco. And it's really, this part of town is um, newer, I guess, because that's where they build, this is where they built the train station. And here, this is what you see as you, of course, the glare won't let me show it. Yeah. Um, and they have the newer buildings. And the immigrants, for some reason, live here. Because up in the old towns, up on the, on the hilltops, um, usually it's houses that are handed down by, uh, through the generations, through the, to the sons. And, you know, there's a lot of um, boarded, not boarded, but empty houses that maybe the kids left and went to live in Rome or Milano or went to live left the country or whatever, and after the grandparents died, um, they just sit there, <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of empty, or, or houses that people in the city have. Um, it's kind of typical of Europe, you know, not necessarily everybody goes to the ocean in the summer to the, to the beach. I guess it's typical of anywhere that's not on the, on the, on, on the, on the shore, on the coast. Um, and so they'll go spend a month in a smaller town where there's maybe um, some cultural activities, some fairs, feasts, I mean. Um, and, the, you know, old folks that they, they regularly see every year when they... You know, it's a, like a little cultural thing. I lived in a town like that and summer for the people that lived in in those really small towns not like the one i live in now is already on the main circulation path of of uh, urban sprawl of the italian urban sprawl even though it's ancient but um i lived in a town that uh for example you had to walk to the train station for about an hour if you needed a car and everybody that lives there was old and we were only about 700 people and um they oh yeah for us like the summer was a time in which people came to visit and like you see new faces or somebody that would come regularly every every december or every you know that's in the south in the southern hemisphere every june or may and they come spend a month or two months and then the house was closed the rest of the year okay well that's it now i gotta wait about 45 minutes for my train to leave all right time to get up Whoop. <laughs> i almost got left inside the train i wanted to show just getting off the train um just the music oh it's not so empty but it is kind of like ghost train ghost train take me um this is going to be too long if i keep recording until i get to the where the buses are that go up to the hospital. But um, there's not much to see. 
I wanted to just go down the stairs and show what the train station was like. And maybe buy the ticket. I'll do that. I'll buy the ticket at uh, the kiosk. Oops, this might disconnect. No, I'm not on the internet. Old man coming out of the elevator. Every time I see my half face, I remember that those videos that Kerry was uploading about the guy that played Batman with his family. I can't, I can't imitate him right now. He was so funny. I didn't even know what he was imitating until I saw Batman. Well, the one that talks like him. Okay, so here we are. And this girl's always here. She's really cool. She's my friend. Oh no, it's a, it's a different one. Oops. Uh, it's pretty empty. I was tempted, of course. Um, Buongiorno. Un biglietto dell'autobus. Per, e per tutta la giornata o devo prendere due? Una ora e trenta. Eh, vale cento uh, minuti il biglietto. Sì, va bene. Ah, uno sessanta? Uno e trenta. Grazie. Grazie. I forgot what I was talking about. I forgot what, okay, so this is, see, I gotta do it the other way around, right? Because I wanna show what I walk towards, and if I always look backwards, it's weird. I wanna get one of those poles. You go around. Anyways, this is the train station. Kind of a, Kind of a modern deal. You can't see it from here, but there's an awesome bridge over there. Back. Oh, it's not a. Yeah, it's. Where is it? Oh, it's that that um, that circle over there. I posted a picture of it. It's a huge tower that holds up with tension cables. A bridge that goes over the tracks. Anyway. And this is a, the infamous sculpture here in Terni because there it is. Because Terni, and I'll do a video later, not now, when I'm walking through the city, I'll do it, was, is known or infamous for having been severely bombed. They leveled it. It was one of those cities like, like Dresden that the Allies uh, just carpet bombed. Maybe it wasn't carpet bombing here, but they targeted all the all the steel factories, because this is where they made the tanks and all the steel was. Um, so when you walk around Terni, and I'll show that in the next video, you see a lot of um, newer buildings and they're more relaxed because in Italy you can't really build tall. In the city of Milan they have an area now in Rome too where you can do towers, but normally cities in Italy are characterized by being no taller than six stories or five, five or six stories. And since Terni was um, leveled, bombed so heavily during the war, and when they started rebuilding, they, I guess, implemented some new codes. And so they have towers. They have apartment towers, like in cities in Argentina. It actually reminds me of, of Mar del Plata a little bit in some places, not really. But um, nothing... Italy doesn't remind you much of any other place, unless maybe you go towards Eastern Europe, um, Russia, and the old Yugoslavia and stuff, because uh, the colors, the colors are always are a certain hue. There are a certain palette of colors. Um, you don't see the bright contrasting colors that you see in the American continent uh, as a whole. You, everything is a little more muted. It's kind of interesting. You can tell just by looking around that you're in Italy or um, even if you go to Spain and France that the, 
they each place has is characteristic and within Italy itself actually you you can sort of see very slightly each area has a, a palette of colors that are more characteristics like if you go to Argentina unless you go to small a small town in the interior all the cities have the same architecture everything was built in the last 150 years except Buenos Aires of course Buenos Aires was heavily built uh, built up in the um, 30s 20s at the beginning of the century and there's a lot of or even older like around the 1900s here comes the uh, no, this one goes somewhere else, I think. The bus, the bus. Comes a bus. Um, but the other cities are all kind of geometric and bright colored. I'm going to ask if this is the one that goes to the hospital. And I have my mask, Sharma. I have it in my pocket in case they ask me or I just it's not changed what, what's it doing so it's not just kind of it's playing with its shocks going up and down oops there it goes okay this wasn't the one all right I'll do another video later As soon as I turned off the video, this one showed up. The bus showed up. People look at you like, look at me like, I feel guilty like I'm not wearing the mask. Sharma. <laughs> See that little sign? They have a tape, you can't, so you can't punch the ticket. Oh yeah, I remember what I was, what I was saying before, you're kind of, I was kind of tempted in Orte. See if I can show the city from here. No, you can't see anything. Um, I was tempted to not buy the ticket because I knew that they weren't going to be checking on the train, so I could have saved some money and, and not bought any of the tickets today. But I did the right thing. I kind of pride myself. This is going to sound really silly, but I pride myself of having a clean record, like being a good citizen. I don't have, I've never been taken to a police station in Italy or, uh, and so I, I feel like I, I was respected. And so I want to give back that, you know, I want to, I buy my tickets, <laughs> you know, I do all, I obey by all the rules. <laughs> it makes me feel like I have a country. You know, not that my country is hunting me down like an animal so that they can pay their salaries and make their jobs, have their jobs make sense to them. You know, I feel like I actually have a place I can trust that is not out to get me. But, you know, I have police trauma, so I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a big social discourse about that because I realize that not everybody is traumatized by Although I have a theory that um, there are thousands of Americans that are living with uh, police trauma, you know, a fear, a, a, pre a prevalent, very subtle fear that's spread out among, you know, we don't talk about, but you know how I know it? Um, because if you talk about what the police do in Italy with anybody, if you'd like meet people at a corner and you're all talking about how what's going on and stuff and then somebody comments oh yeah some police were asking for ID or were going around seeing if too many people were gathering around somewhere or whatever um, you don't hear people repress their comments or make sure they don't say anything negative or controversial about the police or you don't have anybody that kind of blurts out uh, I hate the pigs, you know, there's no hate for the police in Italy, you know, there's no hate for their police.
people, you know, well, you know, sometimes they have attitude, they may be seen as arrogant sometimes, but that's about it. That's as bad as it gets. Um, and there is abuse. There is. There are cases, you know, and, and when they do happen, they don't give it a rest. You know, there's a guy that is still talked about 10 years later that was killed, uh, roughed up and killed inside a police station. And he's like a national hero, you know, uh, a martyr, a national martyr. Uh, we don't talk about, we have things that happen in our, in our police stations. The vast majority of the country has no clue. And they're horrible, thousands of things, incidents, events that are hushed up. And it's a completely different situation. And so... Um, I guess I kind of prove my own theory that the police are the catalyst through which a people will tend to regard with more respect their government and their country or will just say, hey, you know, I don't know you anything. You guys are bastards and robbers and corrupt thieves and, and you know, and all this is not talked about in America, but deep inside, silent in their emotions about institution, country, authority, our tendencies, our um, uh, ways in which a, a, a discourse would, would start with certain, certain thoughts, certain angers, certain uh, reactive uh, judgment without even really getting into any argument. And that's because there is seated already prejudice towards authority and the police and government in the United States. You know, we don't care. The independent media is full, full of, I mean, we just spend all day watching innocent people get roughed up, beat up, thrown in jail, attitude, police arrest and, and become vicious and vindictive just because they, they, the, the person talked back, you know, were, 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 was mouthy. And that's the, that they're they're on a huge ego trip. It's, it's a completely different um, personality situation in the American police, and it's a completely different psychological, uh, uh, a different situation of pressure. You know, because ultimately it affects their humanity to mistreat their own kind. So there's a factor of pressure in police, uh, an American police institution that you don't see. Uh, and the Italian police. You don't see them suffering because they're such bastards. <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen here. They, they probably have a little bit of attitude because and that would affect any human being. To have a weapon to be used against people you don't know would affect the natural psychology of any human being. To be, have the authority of, of putting in a concrete box at, uh, somebody of wh whose life you have no understanding of would naturally create a psychological reaction. So that's why all police in the world, the world over, have some degree of attitude. But in some places they act like people and you laugh and joke with them. And in some places, some places are like the United States. So this ended up being something completely different, wasn't it? All right, hopefully I'll make a fun art, art spin kind of video the last one and I can't do too many more because I'm going to use up all my batteries see there they are looking looking at people drive by <laughs> I'm so I'm really happy about I can't even you know I get emotional I feel like I was saved I, I try to have serious trauma I'm really happy that I'm I don't have American police around me anymore it's, it's like a, 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 a happiness. I, I look at uh, Italian police with, with uh, positivity, like, hey, I want to talk to you. You know, I'm so glad that, that it's you instead of them. Uh, seriously. And you know what I suspect is that a lot of Americans actually feel that way, feel the same way, but we're not talking about it. Wow, it's really so quiet. I can really feel it now because this is the main hospital in in this region of Italy, and um, you usually hear a lot of 
It's low key. No, well, that gate is closed. That gate's not supposed to be closed. I climb up this little <laughs> grassy knoll so I can save walking distance. See what I mean? Those buildings. Come to see this. I want to. I wanted to show this um, later down the road. The Italians were really good about um, new architecture after probably around early on, like after the 50s right away, when there was the whole modernist movement in Europe, the Bauhaus and all that. There's a lock here. How the hell am I going to get in there? Um, and so they... As you don't see what they call what do you call this in English? Half half Oh Jesus, what is it? Um you know when you build a building up against another one and if there's no building in that other lot you you're left with a wall, a white wall that has no windows on it. We don't see that in the States much either. Yeah, you see it in low buildings maybe. Um, well, like, for example, in Argentina, they still do that. They still build, uh, you see, like, towers, and then the, the, the sides of the tower that are up against the, the, the lot are just painted white. And maybe they have some, some, some cuttings that, for um, interior bathrooms or rooms, get some light and air. But they still, they, they were trying to pass laws where they no longer did this. But it's a way of maximizing the lot. And it makes cities look very different here. There's a lot more air that goes around. I had to walk around this whole, come in this way because they had locked that other gate. Um, and so here they they stopped doing it. You still, you see it? What? Uh, that they did it up until old buildings, like in um, maybe early 1900s, you still see buildings that do that. But um, most apartment buildings that look like they were built after the 40s or 50s don't no longer have these walls. They all have room around them. And in in uh, in, Italy, in Rome, you have neighborhoods that are like these type of apartment blocks. They're like little cubes set in a park. It's really cute. I always thought uh, they should do that. Um, anyways, I wanted to introduce you to my my favorite nurse in the whole world. She's just such a hoot she makes me laugh she's outgoing and excited all the time but she also retired and she's um probably not there and everybody's gonna be covered with masks anyway so i'll just do the next video from journey from an interesting part of town ta -ta 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 -ta. the hospital's all spread out and like, uh, <laughs> I always do this. I say I'm about to end it, and I don't. Okay, I'll, sh I'll end it with a, with a shot of a typical Italian pine tree. Oh, well, happy camper. Got my, got my meds. Yeah, these these are really expensive everywhere in the world. And so in Italy, you gotta you have to go get them at the hospital. How did I do it in the states? I forgot. Pick them up. You arrange with a pharmacy or something. Anyways, I I just came out. It's so amazing. The stillness. We're just a bunch of birds before. Now they're all quiet all of a sudden. But I came out, and you feel this stillness. And the Terni is um, is is like in a big valley, a big broad valley surrounded by mountains. 
one of the complaints it gets is that the air is, but actually it's beautiful. I don't know why they it's clean. And um, it gets snow up on the, I love Turney. It's so, it's like a, a little utopia um, with lots of roundabouts, like the one in Pahoa. Everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. You walk a hundred meters, there's one, another one. Um, see, I'll just show a little bit and then I'll record from down below somewhere else. So the hospital's up on a, on a mountain top, kind of, on a, on a top of a hill. All right, I'll do another one from down the road somewhere. Okay, so this is, whenever I come to Turney, I go to this Indian store and I, I stock up on all the things I can't find at Orc Tape, like coconut butter, coconut oil. Well, it's kind of like in between, right? It turns, it gets buttery if it's cold. So it stays surprisingly solid compared to the kind I would find in Hawaii. This peanut butter is the best peanut butter in the world. And supposedly I'm on a ketogenic diet. And so it's got like unbelievable an amount of proteins 27 grams of protein and only 8.5 grams of carbohydrates it's the one that all the Indian stores have here and I'm trying to find I'm trying to I'm trying to do a kinogenic vegan diet which is almost impossible because they're contradictory things and every time you you find a video that will teach you about it because a lot of people come up with that idea they all tell you the same thing it's almost impossible but it's difficult but it's doable of course they wouldn't make a video if they didn't say it's doable these are the lentils that i found have almost equal amount of protein and carbohydrates and this is so unbelievable we don't find this stuff in the states i mean yeah you have to go to a special store it's it's Indian, like an Indian sweet, and it's made out of, I don't know what the hell it's made out of. It's like a buttery, flaky stuff, and this kind, these kinds of sweets always remind me of Iran, of Persian food, Persian sweets. See the, the picture? Like it's got little pieces of pistachio on it. I gotta show this to you. It's the texture is unbelievable. It's like a flaky, a flaky, creamy thing that just. Let's see. Okay, there it is. I ate all. This is like anti ketogenic. It's the opposite. It's full of sugar. Mm, look at how it, it crumbs, it, it falls in little crumbs, in little flakes, and it's buttery and sweet. Mmm. I can't believe I got that. I didn't think it was going to be that bad. I had to try it. Okay, what else did we get? Mm. These are, I, you know it's weird, I, I used to not like cat foods. And then I read that it, they're really good, of course. They're really good for you. I'm trying to open the bag. And when I went into the Indian store, they have them in buckets. So I got cashews. Mmm, my favorite. Lots of peanut. I got two things of peanut butter, two things of oil, of coconut oil, my bag of lentils. And a new soy sauce I haven't tried before. Chinese. 
I'm really picky about soy sauce, and I can't. The problem is that Kiko Man, which is all over the world, is always the most expensive one. So I don't want to pay eight euros for a bottle of the same size. This one costs two euros. It comes from China instead of Japan. It tells you something. All right. Um, I got stopped by the cops. Asked. Uh, if I wasn't aware of the ordinance, um, but we talked. It was cool. They were. I was telling them what I did, and and I asked. I, I explained to them that I just left without asking for a letter at the hospital. I wanted to show the bridge. I love this bridge. It's trippy. And as a segue to what I was talking about before on the bus, you know. I'm just not afraid of cops anymore, and it's wonderful, you know? I mean, yeah, you kind of get like, oh, I'm about to be scolded like a child, you know? But normal, what everybody maybe feels or thinks. I'm not scared of them anymore, you know? And I'm so thankful about that. I really <laughs> I can't even, I can't even, I couldn't live in the States anymore. I couldn't walk, I couldn't walk around the streets whether no matter what part I was, I would see a car, a cop car, and I would wonder if they were they were going to look for a reason to pull me over. All day long, wherever I was walking, wherever I was hanging out, if you see you see police officers get out of a car, immediately you start wondering, are you know are they noticing me? Are they going to look for? Are they going to see something that, you know, you can't breathe? It's horrible. It's horrible what they've done to the country. It's unbelievable. Uh, and and what is really heartbreaking is that people truly, many won't admit it, but are afraid of talking about it. I can take it off here because I'm outside. Are afraid of talking about it. They don't want to admit it, that we all are kind of always walking on eggshells because of how the police has gotten in the States. You know, and politicians are afraid to say anything. Politicians, people are afraid. It's this whole gun mentality of, of, of violence and being strong and being armed and, 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 and uh, glorifying war and this whole thing that has the, our cultural personality kind of evolve, um, um, how do you say this, um, characterized, you know, characterized by uh, fear of, of power and wanting to have power or armed power and wanting to be tough and strong you know this whole thing of, of heroic films and, and people who are who are machines at karate chopping and, and you know and, and falling into banks with the, uh, to do the perfect uh, uh, cyber robbing of an art gallery while they're throwing out karate chops all around them you know this whole thing has got us thinking that we're like soldiers that we and so if you dared propose to a police officer that they I mean um, a politician to make it an issue to tackle the question if America maybe hasn't been incarcerating like mad uh, maniacally over sentencing and not caring about how many innocent people get thrown in jail and shouldn't that be an issue people immediately subconsciously is my belief are thinking armed police wearing boots you know shut up it's like this subconscious um and it's not a ridiculous assertion actually social <laughs> there is psychology and sociology people are a cult have uh, are conditioned in, in a cultural personality to subconsciously uh, feel and think about uh, civil life and society a certain way and <laughs> these are valid issues and it's really sad it's really really sad that uh, our politicians our leaders because are afraid and intimidated in, 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 in saying and uttering maybe police are too forceful maybe they're scaring our citizens into into uh, into into ultimately resulting in disrespect and loathing of government and authority and isn't this an issue? They're afraid of saying that. 
I don't know if anybody has has become aware of this, but have you ever heard any politician, a mayor, a governor, ever talk about excessive force, uh, over incarceration? They don't touch police brutality. They don't touch um, innocents, uh, innocent in jail. They they're all afraid. They stay away from it. Like like, you know, like it was something that is is too hot. We got to keep a distance from. Unanimously. You know, ask me, I have never in my whole life, you know, and this doesn't happen in other countries. Many other countries, many other countries actually make an issue of it. They, here in Italy, they talk about, uh, you know, are, do we have too many people in jail? Are, is, are the conditions... Here we talk about, over in the States, we talk about overcrowding a little bit, but it's almost very functional. Like, are we... Are we maintaining the prison population effectively enough? And then we just jump out of the subject. We don't touch it anymore. We don't talk about the human, the suffering, the, the, the possible injustice and imperfection, uh, the brutal and human imperfection of, of artifice, which is a human-designed institution that can fail, that can err, that can make mistakes, that can get the wrong person, that can list, believe uh, liars, you know, there's tons of people that are, have been thrown in people because of other citizens that have lied. <laughs> they have lied. I know this happens all the time. The law, if you want to get philosophical about the about the, 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 the philosophy of law, you know, it doesn't really take into consideration its own vulnerability, the institution's vulnerability to the to lying of people, the people that consciously think, oh, I'm going to use... The you know there's supposedly some some laws to that would punish that but it doesn't exist they're never used they're never uh, you never hear of somebody uh, getting thrown in jail because they lied about an accusation when has that ever happened so and, and yet the mechanisms st start up regardless of the quality of the accusation. Regardless of whether the accusation is false, it's a, a vicious lie to get somebody in trouble, uh, police uh, corruption, whatever, it doesn't matter. The two sides take their positions, and it's a matter of one trying to defend the person from the other one, trying to find that person guilty, regardless of what happened. So what happens is in America, in our, in our polarized judicial system, is that Arbitrarily, anybody can come under the, the view, the analysis um, of the law. Anybody can be accused of something and put before a court, right? And once you're in that space, so we're talking about the randomness and, and the, um, the arbitrariness of any citizen, anything that could have happened, anything that could be said, or, or anything that did not happen. Any citizen will find themselves, because of an accusation, put before the judge. Once you're in that position, you will have a person whose job it is to find you guilty, whether you did that thing or not. And so what happens? It's almost like, um, like a chewing machine. Our institutional, our, our judicial system is like a... It's like a trap. It's like it's like a, a board game, where you, if you you happen to fall on the wrong square, oops, you're instantly put in a 50-50. Maybe you're thrown in jail for the rest of your life. Maybe you're walk out free. Regardless, irrelevant to um, to whether any you did actually did anything. Some people will argue this is crazy. That's it's not how it works, but it is actually how it works. Um, you know, there's all this, this, this whole construction of logic, mm, probable cause, and da, da 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 and a bunch of stuff that will say the system works. People will, will explain how it may appear that way, but in reality the system works, but it's not true. Because you actually see it all the time. You see people, it's documented, now it's recorded, there's tons of cases documented by not just independent journalism but cases that are even mentioned by mainstream media of people that apparently are innocent and yet they fell into the system where because they were snagged by one of by 50% of the system the ones that 
whose job it is to find them guilty, they are they're snagged in something that they may have not done. It's unbelievable. It's really incredible. We can't be free enough about the design of our world to say, wait, this has got to be designed some some way completely different. This is resulting in possibly three, five thousand people, how many innocent people are actually wrongly accused in jail, uh, monstrously brutal sen over-sentencing for people that actually didn't do anything all that harmful to anybody or, you know, series of a, a compounding accumulation of, you know, having violated your parole and then some judge decided that, you, that you're a problem and that you got to be taught, given a, taught a lesson and you, they throw them in jail for 20 years. And then you ask, what did they actually do? It, it's unbelievable. And that politicians are afraid, are afraid of speaking before, they are afraid, <laughs> you don't see it, but push and push and pressure a politician to talk about certain things and they will, you know, they will uh, wiggle and <laughs> wiggle and, and, and try to get out of the situation or lie and, 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 and present a stone-faced explanation of what they actually think about that and but they will, basically they're afraid of doing things that will undermine their uh, power, their platform, their their uh, position of power over wealth and privileges and everything that, that their position of in, in, in life has uh, has delivered them onto. And so when anything scares somebody in a position of, of wealth, power, money, authority, uh, of losing that that position of privilege, all of a sudden we find that the human being is a cowardly creature that is uh, afraid of, of, of falling into a, a less, a lesser, more, more perilous, more, more dangerous uh, condition that would, uh, you know, we are uh, basically ruled by fear. We uh, pre create this world of, of apparent order and congeniality, but in reality, uh, we're all holding on to, uh, well, I'm, I'm not really, don't have much to hold on to, but anybody that has a, acquired and, um, you know, uh, arrived at, at holding anything or, or, or at, at being in a position of any kind will guard that jealously because we don't trust that the world, deep inside, we don't say it, but we don't trust that the world will be fair and just and kind and compassionate to us being in a more vulnerable uh, or less powerful situation. So basically, we evolved in fear. And so we are always escaping um, fear subconsciously. We evolved for 95% of, of our path, uh, not really being the, the top of the food chain, but being vulnerable to other animals, to uh, conditions of the earth, uh, forces of, of, of what have you. We, our mind has evolved an environment of, of looking out to what can happen, you know, what, what can assail you, what can um, uh, attack you. So we're always a little edgy subconsciously. We don't see it. That's not the human being that we see. But the forces and the dynamics that rule our decisions ultimately in silence are uh, come from an evolution of fear. And so the reason, for example, um, the reason, for example, uh, capitalists believe in capitalism and we know that all these um, wealth and financial power institutions and corporations uh, are, are so greedy and they, they, they don't, they're so inhuman and they have no compassion and they lie about uh, doing things for the community when in reality they're doing it for those few people who are going to benefit and get richer from, with their enterprises. And all of this that we're now talking about a whole lot, it all has to do with basically the human being not wanting to let go of something that allows them to feel a little less fear in their existence. Of course, none of us are conscious of, of us acting 
because of this uh, this characteristic of evolution, you know, wired into our subconscious. But basically, nothing else really explains it. Nothing else ex explains the the senselessness of uh, the impracticality of not being more uh, collectively concerned and collectively nurturing of the whole species, but instead have small groups that try to run faster than the rest and try to grab more than the rest so that they won't have to suffer what, who cares if the rest suffer. That's a species that grew up in fear and is trying to get away from something, it's trying to run away from something. And so you get people that gather in tight groups that have power and are able to run away faster with their power and their wealth and, and make exclusivity, you know, cliques and, and groups of exclusive in different forms of, uh, of companies, institutions, positions of authority and privilege or what have you, all these different types of structures, group structures that uh, define society are basically made by these people that want to uh, keep go running stronger and faster and making sure that nobody penetrates their, you know, or, or messes with it with what they've uh, have been able to arrange in, in, uh, in, in their idea of success. <laughs> but that's basically all it is. That's what's underneath it all is us not realizing that, hey, we're here alone. There's nothing to fear. The species, we only have each other on the world, in the world on the world. We only have each other. There's just another one just like me. You know, there isn't there are no more tigers leaping out of the forest. We're we should be able to cure all diseases pretty soon, hopefully. Uh there's no reason to want to structure and control and dominate and judge and punish. You know, there really isn't a reason to, but that hasn't really arrived to the collective consciousness uh, that would uh, therefore deal with our, our subconscious wiring, which will never go away. But once we realize the fact, uh, the factual reality that uh, we, there isn't a big giant species chasing us around the world, we are here, we only got each other. We, luckily, we have each other and, not, and, and don't have to worry about another species, <laughs> not yet anyways, coming to live with us in the world. <laughs> so... Knowing that would liberate us from our sort of subconscious wiring. And that was what I just explained. These past 17 minutes. All right. Well, I can't believe my cell phone has this much memory. So I'm going to use the bathroom finally. And there's Mr. Officer that just came out. My friends. Okay. See you later.